Pediatric red phone, six minutes. 24 Hours in A&E is one of Channel 4's most groundbreaking documentary series. Jesus Christ. It offers a unique insight into one of the UK's busiest emergency departments. Oh, it's a me! And shows what life's really like on the front line of Europe's largest employer, the NHS. Keep an eye on that other lot, because they want to stab them. This is the behind-the-scenes story of how it's made. Red oh, red bed. It asks why King's College Hospital allowed the cameras in. We understand brain surgery, we understand heart surgery, we don't understand TV production. What impact the series has had on the hospital staff? There's nowhere that I go without being recognised. Yeah, you have jokes. Are you going to appear on Dancing on a Race? <laughs> why and how the public well agreed to be filmed? I was full of morphine. I was full of adrenaline. When they filmed, we didn't know whether Kevin would live or whether he would die. And shows how this award-winning series is made by following this large-scale production as it swings into action once again. When you're in a hospital environment, it's not a film set, this is real. King's College Hospital London, one of the biggest in the country. It's also a major trauma centre and has one of the busiest emergency departments in the UK. I think the staff make King so special. I think um, I've worked in a few different A&Es and there's nowhere quite like King's. Over 200 doctors, nurses and support staff work around the clock, treating 400 patients every day. For the TV producers, it was clear that King's emergency department would make fascinating documentary material. Whilst I don't think it's the case that you can't make this series in other hospitals, I am incredibly pleased that we are at King's because there's a special atmosphere there. There's a special quality to the way the staff work, how they interact with each other, how they interact with the patients. Did you dance? Brilliant. Back in 2010, the producers first took the ambitious filming request to the hospital. The NHS and King's had never before opened their doors to be filmed as forensically as this. Honestly, I'd say my first thought was just, no, <laughs> why? How is that going? How would that be possible? Um, and you know, why would we? Why would we do that? We thought it was quite a big ask, actually, to say, can we come along and put 70 cameras in your emergency department? There's a lot of anxiety about what it would actually mean, given their duty of care to patients. I've got a, an unconscious gentleman who's intubated fall from an unknown height uh, onto concrete. He clinically has severe traumatic brain injury. Nicholas from the first series showed how critically ill and vulnerable patients are a daily reality at King's. We're just waiting for a number and a name. So the question of letting the cameras in was an enormous decision for the hospital trust. This is an area that we don't understand. We, you know, we understand brain surgery, we understand heart surgery, we don't understand uh, TB production. So I was nervous from that point of view. There are lots of programmes about emergency departments and they all tend to be very, very sanitised. It's all very, very nice and, and everything happens in a calm, efficient manner. And I was really worried that that's what was going to be shown. And what I wanted to be shown was actually, a, a, I suppose, a sort of warts and all documentary. We knew that we had a great department, brilliant staff, the patients were fascinating. It was a leap of faith but it was the right thing to do. We thought it would be good for the reputation of the trust because we thought it would enhance the nation's understanding of, of what nurses and doctors do. So we thought that this was a risk worth taking. Nicholas's story illustrated the professionalism of the staff and vindicated the hospital's decision. Kings, without doubt, um, yeah, gave my brother back to me. And you know, you're just lost in admiration. When you walk into that intensive care unit, you just feel stupid. <laughs> it was a fantastic effort um, to get him back to where he was. Um, the technology in, that, um, in both these intensive care unit and the high dependency unit, it was like being on the flagship of the Star Trek Enterprise. It was unbelievable. The, the care, the support, extraordinary. Fabulous. Has he told you? Has he told you he loves you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not that close. <laughs> I can't moisturise my hands. He's <laughs> gonna have one really, really moisturised hand. I can't wank. Vinny. <laughs> Can you bring, can you just put my slippers in the bag as well for me? 
Um, and a bottle of that, you know that by the front door, there's some carver, I'll bring a bottle of that. <laughs> <laughs> Once the hospital had agreed to the filming, the production team then had to approach the emergency department staff. The vast majority of staff initially were, were very pleased to do it. But at the same time, those that didn't want to do, haven't been forced into do it or cajoled into doing it in any way. We, we took a very pragmatic approach to it. Is, are, you, are you happy to appear on camera and have a mic? Yes or no? And, and if you say no, well, no means no. Amy Majors, can I help you? Malcolm and I were having a chat and he was like, oh, you know, Channel 4 are interested in coming and making a documentary, what do you think? And I was like, well, I don't know. What kind of documentary, you know, are they going to make us look horrendous or are they going to make us look good at what we do, you know, because I think we do a really good job. 10, we need room 10. I agreed because I wanted people to know why sometimes the wait in the waiting room is so long, um, because we're dealing with people who are, you know, on the brink of death in another room. Red phone, six minutes. Pediatric red phone, six minutes. Getting the hospital and its staff on side was only the beginning. For the success of the series, it was crucial the producers stuck to one clear idea. The premise of 24 Hours on a &E is to show the work of an emergency department in a single 24-hour period in every one episode. And it really is a 24-hour period. For complete authenticity, no patients are included from outside this strict time frame. It's normal documentaries are trying to tell a story. They're trying to enlighten you on a situation. And they have a shtick, a line, a thought, an argument. 24 Hours on a &E doesn't. It scoops up what happened and edits it together in a way that tells the truth of what happened in that 24-hour period. The producers could never know what each 24-hour period would involve. In series two, baby Josiah was a critically ill infant brought in with breathing difficulties. This is a uh, three-month-old Josiah. Um, it's got a BM of 1.5. It's got temperature of 35.9. This story showed how the challenges of dealing responsibly with a sick baby were not only felt by the emergency department staff. We found this environment, this space, where people come into work every day and save lives. That was really incredibly inspiring and we wanted to reflect that. Right. Mum, you come over here where he can see you. Yeah. Oh, OK. Star, oh, another 10 mils? Yeah. So he's sick at the moment, which is why there's lots and lots of people around the bed, but we're doing all the right things to try and sort that out. What I'd like to think that we managed to do was capture it in a way that made people feel that it wasn't uh, um, intrusive, exploitative, and that uh, we, we weren't... Uh, sort of sugarcoating it. He's crying really well over there, which is good. OK, that's a good sign that he's, you know, awake enough that he's upset at all the mean things that we're doing to him at the moment, so that's good. Unlike many documentaries, the series does not use camera crews. It captures life in the emergency department with a fixed rig. In very basic terms, a fixed rig documentary is one in which you have fixed, remotely operated cameras attached to the wall of an environment, in this case obviously in the A&E department. Series one, we had uh, 70 cameras and I think subsequently we've gone up to, up to sort of 92 cameras. Um, oh, apart from having a brain injury, never better. For the hospital and its staff, this unobtrusive filming technique was key. I agreed because I thought it wouldn't affect how I would do my day-to-day -day job, really. I definitely wouldn't have said yes if it was a cameraman and a camera with a boom mic following me. When they first started filming, I was really aware of wearing a microphone and the cameras were watching. But within a couple of days, that all went out the window and I just got on with work as usual. I won't let my husband do things and he yeah. gets cross. He's right, always. Well, I'll try and get you a bit more comfy, all right? Mm, yeah. Thank you. OK, that's all right, my darling. Rigs are quite contentious in the documentary world. Some people who've never actually made a rig show see them as glorified CCTV. But what 24 Hours and &E does better than, I think, any other documentary series is it captures human emotion and the drama of life in a way that any drama writer would give their right arm to be able to do. And that's because of the rig. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Darling, darling, Daze, it's going to be fine, I promise. When five-year-old Daisy and her father were rushed to King's with severe burns, 
The fixed cameras were able to film without interfering with their right, care. It's all right, it's all right, I'm here, I'm right here. <laughs> Daisy's treatment wasn't in the slightest bit compromised because throughout the process, um, th there was reassurance uh, that the filming was going to be sensitive to the fact that she was in enormous pain and quite a lot of distress. You know what happens when things are bad? Daddy's here. For yeah. three hours, I was full of morphine. I was full of adrenaline and completely unaware that the whole thing was being filmed. You're not, you know, there's more important things to worry about. What do I see when I look at you? My little diamond, don't I? Capturing the genuine emotion as this unfolds in the emergency department is not easily achieved. To film such intimate scenes once again, an army of technicians is getting ready to install a new camera rig for a new series of 24 hours in A&E. This involves a set of cameras more complex than any other used in documentary production. The production team are preparing to start filming at King's College Hospital for the new series of 24 hours in A&E one of Channel 4's most ambitious documentary series. Having the cameras back at King's for a third time, I think it's a very positive thing. It's just continuing the good work of the previous two series and continuing to, to showcase what we do. The production uses remotely controlled cameras to capture life in the emergency department. 78 up by, should be up by the double doors. Yeah. But before they can be installed for the new series, the team must first establish the ideal locations for them with an early morning camera recce, when the department is at its quietest. So, Bob, in terms of numbering, I mean, that's 62, but are we, are we putting a number on the ceiling or are we no, just right. kind of, we, you know, we, you're right with that? Yeah, we're all right. As long okay. as this, um, this um, plan's OK, we'll just go by this. And... It's really important that you do a walkthrough like this because this is a very big camera rig. It's 92 cameras in total across all the different elements of the A&E department. Um, it's a lot of cameras and it's a lot of wiring. You don't want to be two or three days into filming where you realise that the camera positions aren't right. Are they going to be in the same place in each cubicle? Pretty much. Yeah. I think it'd be good to just go through and just yeah. check. This is the third time the cameras have been in the department since 2010. Many of the staff have been filmed before. I've been recognised a lot in the street and around the world and mainly in Australia where my sister watches the show a lot, she recognises me on it, of course. And um, she keeps saying, I mean, that's my, my brother on TV. She does, and she would turn around and say, well, if my nan was alive today, my nan would be so proud of me with the show. It's always become part of my working life in the last couple of years, I think, having Channel 4 in our department. And I think it really does give viewers a good insight into what we do on a daily basis and the things that we have to deal with. To cover more of the patient's journey after they leave the emergency department, each series has extended its filming to other areas of the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we kind of plan for the sort of the ideal scenario, which yeah. is one there, and then what were you thinking, kind of three across the ceiling then potentially? I don't know really. I mean, this... The next challenge for the crew is to investigate filming surgery in one of the operating theatres. Do, you know, do you even know at this stage how many cameras you're going to have in here? Five, does five feel like overkill? Eight, no, it doesn't. Really? Like, I would, if you could, I'd say eight, but you can't, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, OK. Um, Can we work on the assumption of four, and if I can clear another one, so... I say, let's work on the assumption of five. Yeah, all right. Again, all so right, all right. So if five. we had five, yeah. where would... We where can, would... We can make it be five, we'll be five. All right. In somewhere like this, Obviously, it's very quiet at the moment, but on the days that we'll be filming here, there'll be lots of people, there'll be lots of things going on. It's very hard to know exactly where people are going to be and what they're going to be doing. So the idea is to try and fit the cameras where we've got the best chance of capturing the most amount of the story that sort of unfolds in a room like this. In terms of cables kind of coming in, would they they'd come through this external wall, would they? Proposing to install cameras in new areas of the hospital is an enormous consideration for King's Head of Communications, Chris Rolfe. OK, so just so how do the cables get to the gallery? Where do they go? So they'd come through the ceiling tiles to that corridor and then down and through the wall? Well, in truth, every area of the hospital is sensitive. It's not an easy place to film. There's the physical stuff of getting all the cameras in, all the logistics, but more importantly is making sure the staff who work here are able to go about their jobs without being distracted or put off by what we're doing. As far as the whole drilling is concerned, if maybe it was on the Thursday, yeah. that yeah. might make more I mean, sense, wouldn't it? 
we're actually quite lucky even being able to be in here now. If this was normal, it would be a disaster. It would be an absolute yeah. nightmare. It would be yeah. impossible. Yeah. The collaboration between the production team in Kings and the Garden and Kings and Channel 4 and Kings is fundamentally important. Mainly, I think it's all about accepting that there will always be problems, there will always be things to overcome. But in talking to each other and, and trusting the approach, um, you will get there. And in this corner of CT, there's now a monitor that's been placed that apparently wasn't there before. Which Once the camera positions are confirmed, the producers must discuss how to minimise the filming's impact on the patients, with the head of the emergency department, Bryony Sloper. Yeah, I think, was there always a filming sign outside the front of the hospital saying, no. A and E, you know, we're filming, is that...? No, it was only inside. No. OK. And if you see that sign on the outside door before you make the choice to come in, you could think, oh, I'm going to be filmed, no, and it could deter okay. you coming in. Mm. And if you need care, you need care. Even, so yeah, well, however I'd you fit around not, the wording, it could give that impression, you're yeah. right. So I'd rather okay. not have anything. There are massive challenges with rigging the department for a programme like this because obviously we run a, a hugely busy emergency department, over 400 people a day, whilst we're trying to install all of these cameras around patients and staff without uh, interfering with any patient care at all. So it is a massively stressful undertaking. With the negotiations complete, the emergency department can once again be rigged with cameras and microphones. They will record non-stop for six weeks. An entire outside broadcast unit is being mobilised. Dozens of technicians work round the clock to install two production porter cabins, 92 fixed cameras, and a hundred microphones. What the rig enables us to do is to put 92 cameras in the emergency department and just hang out there for six weeks to see everything that comes in and out. We get what we think is a very authentic picture of what life is like there. It looks like and is what would be happening if we weren't there. Everything has to be linked by miles of cables concealed in the ceilings and basements of the hospital. It's hard for people to realise just how much cable actually goes into producing a programme like this. We've been running the sound cables in for all the microphones and the camera cables. In total, it's somewhere in the region of 26 kilometres of individual cables, probably comparable to quite a large golf tournament. The emergency department never sleeps and never shuts. The engineers have to work in the dead of night when the department is quiet and many of the treatment bays are empty. Well, it's the third time round now, and, yeah, it's just a bit more upheaval. You know, we've got to make sure that patients' privacy is utmost and we're able to get on with our work without anybody getting in our way. The priority is the staff who are working in the hospital. If, if we can't get somewhere, we can't. We just have to wait and hope that we can get in at some point. I mean, you're in a hospital, so there's sick people around, so we try and be as discreet as possible and as quiet as possible. <laughs> A room normally used for storing medical supplies is being transformed into two state-of-the-art television galleries. They will manage the 8,000 hours of footage and serve as the operations base for 170 crew for six weeks. Rigging one of the UK's busiest emergency departments like a film set is only half the challenge. The programmes are not possible without the permission of the staff and patients to be filmed. What languages do you know to speak? None. I was taught French, but I didn't understand it. Bonjour, comment ça va? Ça va très bien, merci. À toi. Oh, there you go. You can speak a bit of French. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, whatever I can do that. To film the full range of cases that come through the emergency department, Kings and the Garden Productions have devised a detailed consent protocol for filming. As part of a documentary series about an emergency department, you have to show those patients who are most seriously injured. A senior clinician and a senior clinician only will give consent to film, but that is only to film the work of the staff and not the patient themselves. So the consent process for, for the patients in recess can be very, very difficult. And 
And sometimes there's actually no question around even asking about consent. Ultimately, the clinicians have the final say and the patients have the final say. And that's really how it has to be. Ensuring the emergency department's staff are comfortable with the programme's consent process is vital. I'm Emily, so I'm one of the floor producers, and I just wanted to touch base really today before we start filming, just to talk about kind of consent with you, to see whether you had any questions. So you only found out last week that we are meant to be obtaining consent from patients, especially in the racist area. So I do wonder how that, how does that happen and how that has happened in the past. Definitely would encourage you asking some of the consultants who've done it before how mm -hmm. they found it, but I think you'd find it reassuring. It's not about... Um, you know, us asking for consent, because we do that all the time for lots of different procedures, so it's something that we're used to. The worry is, because patients in recess tend to be a kind of time-critical patient, is when we would exactly have the time and kind of where in the patient journey the consent actually fits in. A 93-year-old man that's been knocked over just outside. In Series 2, Ernest was an elderly victim in a road traffic accident. Your ears do prick up because you think, 93-year-old guy, and was struck by a car in a hit-and-run that didn't stop. This is going to be harder than a 20-year-old. This case highlighted the fundamental role the doctors play, not only giving life-saving treatment, but also bringing stories to the screen. So when I was first approached about the idea, I had quite a few reservations, and, and those reservations weren't necessarily about the department being filmed. It's what, what it would actually show at the end of it. But what 24 hours does show, it shows what really happens in emergency departments. Oh. Okay. It's got no pulse. So when you actually then finally get to see the the end product, it was, well, actually, this is what really happened. And it's not the sort of thing where you don't know you've hit someone. And you can't tell me that someone is driving their car, hits someone and doesn't know they've done it. You just think, bleep me out. Gaining consent for filming is crucial, but before the shoot begins, the large production team must go through special training to prepare them for working in such a challenging environment. You'll constantly get thwarted about following your big story through. It's not a drama. You don't get to write the script for it. Filming is about to begin for a new series of 24 Hours in A&E. What is 24 Hours in A&E? Yes, it is a medical series, but actually it's not your classic medical series. With over 170 staff, the production team is unique in its scale for a documentary. The editorial team must meet to discuss working in the hospital and today are being briefed on the subject of story. It's about the human relationships. You know, it really is about how people interact in difficult circumstances. This series is really complex for us as a production. There's 170 people, 92 cameras, 100 microphones, 30 radio mics. These all make for a lot of things going on. But actually, it's still about telling a good story with a great character. How soon until she goes to CCU? She's not going to CCU at the moment. She's not stable enough, he said. He said he's afraid she'll go along the way. The King's Emergency Department staff regularly have to deal with death. In Series 2, Dr Matt's story showed the humanity of the frontline medical team. Death is part of life and death is expected. But when it's a death that happens on your watch, it's, you know, you take a step back and you think, what could I have done? Little breaky break. I just need to. Uh... You need to go and have a break. I try not to get emotionally attached to patients. You are there to do your job. <sighs> but if you don't feel something when someone is really ill or when someone has died, then you really can't do your job as a, as a doctor, as a nurse, if you don't understand where that grief and the suffering is coming from. You all right? Yeah, I just need to five minutes of air. Most of the stories across the series come from the rich variety of patients and their loved ones who come through the emergency department. Can I have a receptionist to recess to book in? As a documentary maker, you use your instinct and you rely on that instinct, and it's the same thing with the rig. You don't just film everything. You don't pray and spray 
as they say, you, you, you know, you need to still be quite selective. You think that person looks just straightforward, they're interesting, through to they're having a crisis. Look at me, sir. Yes, family. Tell me which finger I'm moving, OK? Right. In series one, 65-year-old Charlie showed how a story about a family can start slowly... Right. ..but take everyone by surprise. Charlie Brown was a taxi driver that had, um, a few days previously, had an accident in his cab and banged his head, but they discovered that he'd had okay, a stroke. Bang, that's massive, huh? Huh? He's walking around like that? Yeah, he, is. he, he doesn't know yet. Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah. I mean, he hasn't shown stronger symptoms then. Yeah, he's got very strong symptoms. First rule is actually what doesn't make a good story necessarily is the seriousness of the case. What brings people into King's is just the key that unlocks the door to their life. He's got a part, a bit of his right side of his brain missing. <laughs> Fuck no. <notes. laughs> and I keep laughing in shock. <laughs> I don't know. Poor, poor Pat, she's laughing with me. Pat, what does it mean? What's that to Grand Pat. Where's he gone? <laughs> I don't know where he's lost it. <laughs> One of the passengers. I don't took know it. then. <laughs> then you have the family there. They were outspoken, full of love for him. You're seeing this moment unfold. Nothing is um, uh, ambiguous. It, it's, it's all there. And you know exactly how they feel, you know exactly what they're going through, and you can relate to them immediately. It's horrible <laughs> just to see him laying there. <laughs> the way he keeps talking. Yes, well, I hurt. As you'll know, Doctor, they call it when a patient balls eyes and he's talking so posh, and, and then one minute he's talking like that, the next minute he turns around to me and he goes, You're all right, cock. <sighs> you know, I know this sounds really horrible, but I just keep thinking, How am I going to cope with her having treatment, him being like this, looking after a baby? I can't do it all. And... For me, some of my favourite bits of um, A&E are where the storytelling takes you far, far beyond the actuality that you're seeing, because you really touch on the context of people's lives and the whole of their lives. They may be in this A&E department for a few hours, but I think actually the series tells a much bigger story than that. OK, guys, this is Kofi. He's 11 years old. Approximately one hour ago, he was a pedestrian versus car seemed to be thrown approximately 20 feet against the wall. With Kofi was a critically injured patient who featured in the first series. Kofi got knocked over today. When his dad was interviewed months after Kofi had left hospital, it became clear their story was much more about the father-son bond than the scale of his injuries. When Kofi was born, he was my first boy, and to look down and see, I have a son, you know, was... Um, was um, what was amazing. The medicine is my job, it's my life, it's my career. So while that's interesting, I see it all day, every day. It's that stuff that I would never, ever get to see and never get to hear. That is what keeps me watching it. And I always remember the first thing that I did um, with, with him, as I took him when I took him and I, I, I held him up in the air and just, just said, um, I counted his toes, I counted his fingers and, you know, looked over him and then I just held him and held him up in the air and I said, thank you, God. He said that himself. I didn't prompt him. I just asked him the question and he told us that story. And to me, it just meant so much more to hear that than him saying I was really worried. When I saw Kofi for the first time, it, 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 it was, um, it, it devastated me. If I could have swapped places with him, I would have. I thought, I'm 40 years old, um, you know, he's, his life is just starting. After being treated at King's, Kofi went on to make a full recovery. It was good to, to wake up and see my dad's face. Because I felt more safe, like, there's not a better feeling. Because my dad is great. I love him. 
people aren't in the programme unless they're happy to be. But the process of trying to establish whether they're happy to be is very, very complicated. And it may be some time before they're able to decide whether they do want to be in it, and if they don't want to be in it, that they're not. A story that we've got, Ken Thames bringing a patient, a 40-year-old male fall from a height. When Kevin was admitted to King's with life-threatening injuries, his treatment was filmed for Series 2. His family agreed for the filming to take place, understanding they didn't have to make a final decision on it being aired until later. In the more serious cases, we have a two-tier consent, which means that um, even while consent has been given to film, we would always go back afterwards um, and ask whether they were still happy for their contribution to, be, to end up in the finished films. He okay. broke his collarbone. He broke some vertebrae in the top of his back. He broke 10 of his ribs. And he had this severe brain damage. They said he was very poorly and that he might not make it. I think you just have to remember that you're, you're the least most important thing that's happening. And you have to wait for a time to come around when people may or may not have the time to talk to you. However, if the patient team have the right level of patience and tenacity, but also they're able to build honest relationships with people, there may come a time when people really want to talk to us. She's got a song that she thinks you'll like. The production team were really sympathetic, kind, helpful. Anything you wanted to ask them, you could ask them. If you felt you didn't want to do it, you didn't have to do it, which we didn't mind. Obviously, Kevin was laying there in a coma, so he couldn't really say much. The producers had to wait three months during Kevin's recuperation before he gave his permission for the story to be broadcast. To still be here now is... Makes me feel like I'm a bit of a, a Superman character, really, to be honest with you, because I think 99 out of 100 people, you know, wouldn't be sitting here now, and it's unbelievable, really. If I had the chance to say anything to staff at King's, it would be thank you so much, because if it hadn't have been for them, Kevin wouldn't have been with us today. Home again. <laughs> It's the day before filming begins for the new series. The crew are in the gallery being briefed on working with the 92 cameras. After the initial consultation, you can basically park them up on Stream F until their relative or wife or husband comes in and we can get D and E standing by for the red phone that we've just taken. This is the fun bit, radio mics. Um, and the floor teams receive instruction from a sound engineer. Once you put a radio mic on someone, you need to talk to the gallery and say, I have put Dr. Graham on mic 13. If I don't know what mic someone is on, I don't know. I have 130 faders and the other guy has 130 faders. So it gets quite wearing. It sounds quite simple, but it's amazing how easy it gets forgotten. The team who film when a patient leaves the main camera rig are going through their final checks. I think the challenge is always going to be sort of getting the right angle. We want it to feel like the rig. We want it to look like the rig. It's emergency medicine. You know, we're not going to have loads of time. It's going to be running around, uh, grabbing stuff. We've got things on suctions that are going to get, you know, we can stick onto the wall. So I think the idea is we cover ourselves, you know, to, to, to film as best we can, really. The intensive installation and preparation has come to an end. The next time the gallery powers up, it'll record the life of one of the UK's busiest emergency departments non-stop for six weeks. I'm nervous about things like when we turn the cameras on first thing in the morning, they don't work. Um, I'm nervous that as soon as we press record, no patients come in the door for a few hours. Um, but I know those things are going to be all right. So I suppose now I'm just... Um, I just want to get going. Everyone wants to get going. There's a lot of sort of excitement. It's been a very sort of buzzy atmosphere today. Um, and then we're all just waiting for seven o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, oh yeah. cool. um, that's pretty much it. Filming for the new series of 24 hours in A&E has started. Red oh, Redford. Stand by Redford. Safety,
Hello, Kings. Emma to Charlotte, did she sign a release form? A yeah, yeah, yeah. Over six weeks, the crew will work round the clock in two television galleries to capture the life of the emergency department using 92 cameras. They will go on to make 28 episodes to be broadcast to 54 countries. Red red phone. Phone. And we have another red phone. And then we've got a red phone. We're on it. When that red phone goes, you're kind of like hardwired to know the tone of that exact phone. You want to know what it is, you want to know who's going to take it, you want to know how long it's going to be, and you just think this could be it. The gallery teams are keeping one step ahead of the action. Yeah, it sounds like a stroke, 50 year old male. And on the floor in the emergency department's resuscitation unit, producer Rachel is busy establishing what and whom they can film. Having the Channel 4 production team back around seems very familiar. It doesn't feel like they have a lift, to be honest. The crew, they're very good at not getting in the way of, of our treatment of the patients. So are you all right for us to kind of film sensitively? Yeah. Having a floor producer on the shop floor, although initially they're the stranger that you don't really know, they've started to pick up medical terminology and you start to be able to have almost medical conversations with them. Does it sound like the kind of thing that we can kind of film anonymously for now until we can approach the patient? Depends what they're like. If they're lucid, they don't. Despite having 92 cameras to choose from, the gallery team can only record on a maximum of seven at any one time, so it's vital they work out which bay a patient will be treated in before they arrive. This is bay four, we think, yeah. You think it's bay four, hopefully? Yes, we do. Hopefully, although they do like to change the bay numbers. Um, and I've also had a chat with her about asking the consent question, and she's happy to do that. She's been prepped to ask the consent question. Lovely. Questions. And Gaia's going with it, feeling this one already. How many minutes? 15 minutes' time, OK. It's not just the production team inside the hospital that is working hard to follow stories. OK, great. Yeah, OK, I'll head up there now. That's a cath lab case coming in, which means that someone is um, probably suffering from a heart attack. Hopefully they'll allow us to film. Obviously it's very sensitive, you know, if someone's having a heart attack, it's going to be quite tense. Okay, so that was a, a gentleman brought in who was uh, suffering from a heart attack, um, came in with a relative um, who very quickly told me that she wasn't happy for us to film. So um, obviously, you know, um, we can only do this with the consent of the patients. So we've, uh, we've downed our cameras um, and uh, I think it's just sort of heading off now and just uh, wait until the next thing comes along, really, so. Many of the patients featured in the series come through the emergency department's waiting room. My name's Charlotte. I work for documentary series 24 Hours in A&E. Do you know it at all? No. Assistant producer Charlotte is gauging people's interest in being filmed. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, would you be happy for us? We're always looking for patients that would be willing to let us film with them whilst they're here, whilst they're being seen by the staff. Um, and would you guys be interested? No. no? no Okay, don't worry, it's absolutely no. People don't see us, <laughs> absolutely fine. And those guys that are on the floor, they're on the front line. You know, you've got very sick people all the time. You've got people that don't agree with the filming. You're contending with, you know, someone in the gallery asking you questions all the time. Not forgetting you're in a hospital environment. You know, it, it's not a film set. This is real. Hi there. Sorry to bother you. Do you mind me asking why you're here today? Oh no, what happened? Which time is it? This one here. Race track. So you're a race car driver. Gosh, that's quite exciting. I haven't met many race car drivers in the waiting room. <laughs> People don't often want to speak to you when they're sat in an A&E feeling sick, so you've got to be able to read a situation. You just have to be, I think, just a friendly person and someone who's, who's quite happy to listen to people. Would you be happy to let's film with you whilst you're here today and whilst you're being treated by the guys yeah. here? Would that be all right? Lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much. So if you want to mic him up, then go ahead. Let me just check to see if I've got a mic in my bag. Ah, as if my magic, I do. So that rarely ever happens. For the patients in the series that have been filmed on the rig, an important part of concluding their story takes place outside the emergency department. Johnny has been dispatched once again, this time hoping to film on one of the paediatric wards at King's. 
Hello. How are you? <laughs> so, you know, what we just want is just a, just a few shots to show that she's back to her normal <laughs> self. When people are filmed on the rig, um, there's, no one, there's no one operating the cameras that they can see. But when you're on the grounds and you're filming, you've got a camera, it's very obvious that you're filming them. Um, I think as a result of that, you have a different relationship with people. Um, it's much more personal. Uh, you need to be able to build relationships very, very quickly. Thank you so much. That's great. 24 Hours in A&E continues to capture the stories of the amazing mix of people who come through the doors of King's. The programme has made a huge impression on the emergency department's staff. The series has definitely impacted on me. I, there's nowhere that I go without being recognised. My relatives, all my family, were just absolutely gobsmacked by what I did. Um, my brother was like, oh, that's why you're so tired all the time. I was like, yes. Can we just ring 5620? CT should be ready. And Angio, he's got no obvious blood in his belly. Talking to both colleagues at work and, and friends who are, uh, are not nurses, doctors, I said, wow, it's really interesting to see what you really do. Got quite a lot of ribbing for it, as you can imagine, and jokes about, oh, are you going to be the new Dr. Hillary on daytime TV? And are you going to appear on Dancing on Ice? <laughs> the day after my particular episode aired, um, I think the first thing that ever happened was I was walking on my way to work, I was walking through the car park, and some random woman stopped me and said, you made me cry last night. <laughs> then me mate oh, yeah. and you could be the next Tom Cruise. I'm like, no, thank you. No way. I'm just playing old Porter Kevin from 24 Hours in A&E. She's topping you up with vodka. I don't want you to have to drink it. It's too much effort. I'll just put it straight in. I personally like watching the waiting room because we don't ever see that. We don't see people sitting, chatting, having a laugh. Some of the conversations that you hear are just hilarious. And they never give you a straight answer. Ask the nurse, do you think that I'm going to be able to get an inhaler? I'm asthmatic. Obviously, I'm going to need it. This is her to me. Oh, it's highly possible. It's <laughs> passion. <laughs> No, just do that one. Bollocks. No, 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 no. John, no. just put it. No. I'll, I'll take that crutch off, isn't it, Chad? It was quite good. What makes her good? She's just a bit dirty, really. Quite fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she's quite annoying, so I think. She's quite annoying. Yeah. The propensity for men to put up with annoyingness for good sex is what most marriages are based on. <laughs> uh, there was a a chap in a recent episode that was saying that, you know, we should complain like you would at McDonald's. You wouldn't wait at McDonald's for an hour. You go to McDonald's and they have, you know, you can fill out a card. I am satisfied, I am dissatisfied. Because I would like to say <laughs> I am dissatisfied at this juncture. Yeah, well, you're not getting a bloody Big Mac here. A bit frightened. You're a bit frightened. Yeah. OK, well, I'm not scary. Yeah. I know yeah, you don't know me. bigger than she is, so don't exactly. worry. Exactly. I'm tiny. For Channel 4, the special relationship with the hospital is fundamental to the success of the series. 24 Hours in A&E was one of our biggest ever documentary commissions, and King's College Hospital really embraced the production company and Channel 4's ambition. And I think without their help, without their commitment to the process of making this series, it wouldn't be half as good. It was a massive leap of faith on their part that hopefully they feel was repaid. Oh, you'll bloody get better, right? You hear me? You're having a full service history. Mm. You're having a memo until you're done, we're going to get you out of here, right? All right. right. And you've all got each other here. And you do that, I think. Shut up. I hope that 24 Hours in A&E shows the general public that the NHS is absolutely outstanding. Definitely within our emergency department and probably emergency departments up and down the country, we do amazing work on a daily basis. For the patients and their relatives who've appeared in the series, it remains a positive experience. Well, at the time when they filmed the 24 Hours, we didn't know whether Kevin would live or whether he would die, but I don't think we were brave. I just think it was just to show other people what the doctors and nurses do in the hospital. It's a very interesting series. It is brilliant. And, and for every complaint about the NHS, don't forget 
particularly in A&E, and from our experience, particularly in King's, the experience you get there, the quality you get there, is, is out of this world. And when there's a problem, that's where you go, and there's a pretty good chance you'll come out of it walking. Good news is no news. Only bad news makes the papers and the TV. Um, for every operation that goes wrong, 50,000 go right. They don't make the papers. And for King's College Hospital, the series has an enduring legacy. Recently, the, the reputation of the National Health Service has taken quite a battering. Uh, so looking back and, and hopefully looking forward, uh, the fact that we've been prepared to be as transparent as we have been, hopefully will go a long way to helping the patients that, that we serve and that the NHS at large serves, helping them have confidence that the NHS is, is, is a world-class organisation. And we're very proud that, that, we, that we decided to do this when perhaps others, others might have chosen to, to have not taken the risk. Well, listen, well, who's not busy? Squeeze that. We can't give up. Oh, no, come on. We've got to be strong for Mum. If it is the last bit, hey. All the patients you're about to see were treated in one department in just one 24-hour period. After the finishing touches are added, one of Channel 4's most ambitious documentary series is ready for broadcast again. Love, it's a reflex. It's what you do for many of the families, despite the devastation that they may be facing, they give unconditional love. <laughs>